As always, I appreciate this opportunity that I have to speak to you. If you would, be turning over to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. That will serve as our text this morning. Before we do get into the text, by way of introduction, I'd like to address what we'll be talking about. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and through 28, we find that our Creator made mankind. We find that He made only two genders, male and female. Then later on in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We see here that there is a divine pattern instituted. God made Eve, the woman, and joined both her and Adam together in marriage. With Adam's proclamation, this pattern for the home was set. We see later on in Matthew chapter 19 verses 1 through 12 and Mark chapter 10 verses 1 through 12 that Jesus sought to restore this sacred relationship, this pattern for marriage. One man, one woman living together for life. He gave but one exception in order to dissolve this marriage union and that is fornication. Christ expects each of us today to abide by this pattern for marriage. Now, building upon this pattern leads to a fully functioning home. We see that each member of the home has a specific role or roles, both the husband and the wife. Later, they become father and mother because children arrive on the scene. Following this pattern allows for the home to grow properly and thus each member of that home to grow and mature as God expects. Now our text, again, Ephesians chapter 5, details how family members must conduct themselves in the home if indeed they're going to be pleasing to our Creator. God expects this of us. We find that this is just another way for the church and Christians, members thereof, to make known the manifold wisdom of God. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10. Now I think all of us realize that the home is the most basic building block of a society. The family unit develops and these relationships grow and it provides a means of these individuals within that home to function in reality. Now the home, a godly home, the one that God expects to exist and to function as he has outlined, is where all forms of teaching must begin. It is where godly examples should be set. They should be seen, not just heard, not do as I say, not as I do. And godly examples must be followed. The home allows for these. When the homes are healthy, society is healthy. And I think we all can see that our society is not very healthy. There are many who have 
attacked the home throughout the years, and that seems to be growing more rabid as the days go on. Now going to our text, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22 through 24. Here we find the responsibilities in marriage, specifically the duty of the wife. Verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. From these verses, we see that the wife is to obey her husband in everything. She is to submit to him the same way as if it were the Lord. And the example given is that of the church. How closely does the church submit to Christ in everything? Now this term submit comes from the Greek word hupotasso. Now this word is employed in Colossians chapter 3 verse 18. A parallel passage to the one we just read specifically regarding wives. It is also used in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 16 where it depicts those who are strong and charitable where we are supposed to submit to those basically learning how to be strong and charitable ourselves. We see this word used in James chapter 4 verse 7 where it's being used to submit to God. Then 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 13 where we are to submit to the laws of government. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5 we are to submit to those who are older and to one another. Now this term submit is a military term and it denotes rank. It simply means to obey or to bend one's will to another's. In this case, the wife is to bend her will to that of her husband's. Franklin Camp, in his book, A Study of the Book of Ephesians, has this to say about the idea of submission. Quote, we need to think we need to make the point that the submission of the wife does not indicate inferiority. Some get the idea that the wife submitting to, their, to her husband would denote that the wife was inferior to the husband. But that's not true. For example, in John chapter 14 verse 28, Jesus said, My father is greater than I. But in John chapter 10 verse 20, he says, My father and I are one. In relationship to his redeeming work, his father was greater than he was. It does not mean that Christ was inferior to God. He is still deity. But in that relationship, he was in submission to the will of the father. It does not denote inferiority. That's something we must keep or be kept clearly in mind. End quote. The husband is the, the head of the wife just as Christ is the head of the church. You pick out any successful organization and you will find in every time some form of chain of command. There are different levels of authority. In the family, God has prescribed that this chain of authority be the head, that is the husband, over the wife. Now, I think many of us are familiar with the concept of feminism. This terrible idea tells women that it is wrong to submit to her own husband, yet perfectly acceptable to submit to her employer. Going further, that it is looked down upon for this wife to serve her family. However, with God, being a godly mother is highly prized and highly praised, regardless of what any feminist might say. In our text, continuing there to verse 25, we see now the responsibility of the husband. 
It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that should it be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. A godly husband is expected to love his wife. Verse 25. Such is designed to bless and benefit her. He should love her just as he loves himself. And as we just read, and I think it's quite obvious that we love ourselves. We want to take care of ourselves. We nourish and cherish. That is the idea that, of what the husband should do for the wife. Now just as the wife is expected to exhibit God's wisdom... In submitting to her husband, the husband is expected to exhibit God's wisdom in employing the same love of Christ towards her. As head of the church, Jesus is a benevolent monarch. When a husband exercises his authority as head over his own home, he is, in a loving manner, he is acting just as Christ does with his church. Now part of heading a home is promoting stability and love. This is a major point of emphasis regarding the husband. Now as we repeat God's pattern for the home found in verse 30 through 33 again Ephesians 5 says for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular love or so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Husbands and wives are expected to become one. This shows their unity. Verse 32 shows that Paul is using what would be common to those that he's speaking to. And he's using it to explain a great mystery. The common idea is that of marriage. You see, this is no new concept. This is how God has expected every home in existence to act, to conduct itself since the beginning. God, or excuse me, Paul is referencing this sacred union to show the relationship of the church to our Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the great mystery, the relationship between Christ and his church. So he's making an analogy, something that they knew very well of, that is the marriage bond, to describe the church. And verse 33 very well sums up our preceding verses from the text. A successful marriage is to be built upon love and respect. The wife reverencing her husband, the husband loving his wife. Now I hear sometimes about certain aspects of this being conditional. And the wife, it'll be a video that I've seen, a wife will say, well, I'm going to conditionally respect him. If he doesn't do this, I won't respect him. But if he does this, I will. And the rebuttal to that was, well, is it conditional for him to love you? Well, no, he's supposed to love me. Exactly. We've got to have love and respect for each other. Specifically mentioned here, the wife must revere her husband. That's not conditional. Just like it is not conditional for a godly husband to love his wife. Now from our text thus far, 
we can see 14 different aspects of this quality of love that should be found in marriage. First, it should be a sacrificial love. When you're single, it's I. When you marry, it's we. There has to be some amount of sacrifice in order to make that we work. It's a special love. It's distinct from any other relationship. It is selfless. Each one places the other first. It is a spending love. Each spends all they have and are on the other. It is a spiritual love. The Holy Spirit used the word agape to describe the type of love that husbands and wives should have. And that they are basically seeking the best for their spouse. What is the highest good for anybody, especially husband and wife? That is achieving heaven when our life in the flesh is over. Husbands and wives should be working together to help each other get to heaven. If you're not doing that, you're failing. Now, as Christians, we do that as well. We should be loving the lost in this same sense, which is why we're supposed to be teaching the gospel to the lost. Next, this is a separating love. When a, husband, or a man and woman marry, they are creating a new home, separate and apart from each of their parents. I think oftentimes this gets out of focus, and it's never or rarely, rarely ever thought of. But they're making a new home, and it is apart from the jurisdiction of both of their parents. This love is meant to be sacred. Marriage must be protected and appreciated. Just the opposite is being done in our nation. It's being eroded. It's cast down. This type of love should be a suffering love. Each other or each spouse feels the pain that the other feels, thus further denoting the type of oneness that spouses should have for each other. It is a submissive love. There must be a mutual submission, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. We're submitting one to another in the marriage bond. As the head of the home, the, the husband is going to do what is best, not only for the wife, but for the home. Obviously keeping her in mind when he heads his home. This type of love is a superior love. This type of love, as we said, was agape. It's the same type of love that God has for the world. Husbands and wives should possess this superior love for each other. It is a sanctifying love. Immorality and impurity have no place in the home. They have no place anywhere, but specifically between husband and wife. These two negative characteristics have no place in that marriage bond. It must be a single love. Again, hearkening back to the pattern. One woman for one man. At one man for one woman. And 14th, it should be a satisfying love. Each spouse is complementary. And they will always care for the other. Now if you follow this recipe, though it is difficult, you will have a happy and godly marriage. Now secondly, we consider the responsibilities within the family. We're going beyond simple marriage or husband and wife. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, we'll read the first three verses at this time. This is speaking of the roles of children in the home. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. God expects children to obey their parents. Doing so 
brings honor to their parents. This is also speaking on how they are to obey. It's not just listening to what you're told and then doing it. You're not murmuring or complaining while you do it. You're not following after the children of Israel in the wilderness wandering. In certain instances, they obeyed Moses, by extension God, but they murmured. They were complainers. They spoke against God and Moses. And because of their sin, they were dealt with accordingly. Thus, there is no murmuring or disrespectfulness from the children in obeying their parents. Now, God says that this is right. We can see this for at least two reasons. First and foremost, and this is true of many things we find in the New Testament, simply because God said so. It pleases Him. Colossians 3, verse 20. And secondly, it also benefits the child. Obeying one's parents can allow for longer life upon the earth. If children are taught to respect authority in the home, they will respect it elsewhere. You think of all the different riots that we've seen over the last three or four years. You think any of those kids, those children had godly homes? More than likely not. They had no respect for authority. It's one thing to stand up for a cause, but you'd better pick a good one. But you're disrupting, you're destroying. That is not God's plan for a godly child. Yet that is what we see time and time again. There are other forms of debauchery which children and even some adults engage in. Some of these can cause injury, others cause death. Alcohol, the poison that many people drink. You drink too much of it, you get behind the wheel, and you kill yourself. Or you kill the family that's in oncoming traffic. Had you maybe listened to your godly parents, wouldn't be in that situation. But unfortunately, these parents are not setting godly examples for their children. Because they're getting boozed up at home, probably watching a football game themselves. Not a godly example. Now, obeying one's parents also has spiritual repercussions. You see, these children will learn the importance of obeying their creator. As parents, we provide, or we should provide, for every need of our children. Not, need, not want, but need. The same way God provides for his children. Children can pick up on those things. They learn the importance of obeying their parents. That allows them to grow the capacity for obeying God themselves. Which ultimately will lend itself, giving that child the capacity to obey the gospel. Which should be our goal as parents, to have our children saved. But if we never actually teach them the gospel in the home, and we wait for assemblies such as this, do you really think they're truly converted? Now, not specifically mentioned in Ephesians 5, I would like to take this time to deal with the mother, the role of the mother in the home. After all, you cannot have children without a mother. Scientifically impossible. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14 says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. God, by the hand of Paul, decreed that young women are permitted to marry and in that marriage bond bear children, thus becoming mothers. As a mother... The woman is expected to guide or lead her family. God details his idea of a virtuous woman in Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. I would encourage you to read that passage. We certainly don't have time this morning, but that is God's woman in that passage. Specifically, the mother in a godly home. 
Her work must be such that no one can slander her home. Again, 1 Timothy 5.14. Now this concept is expanded upon in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. It says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may be able to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You see, the older women are expected to be themselves good and wise, but to also lead by their example and be able to teach these younger women on how to act as not only wives, but as mothers. So you see the generational passing down of information, knowledge, and wisdom. They are expected to demonstrate the godly qualities to the younger women, specifically the mothers. Now we see that they are expected to be affectionate not only to their own children, but also their husbands. They should exhibit maternal traits, that is, being fond of their children. Now, there have been studies regarding mothers, their children, and the use of daycares. And they have found that in order for a child to adequately deal with their mother dropping them off at a daycare, that mother died. In the mind of that child, the mother is dead. She no longer exists. I am in the custody of this daycare. In order to cope with jumping their children off of the daycare, what do you think happens in the mind of the mother regarding the child? You're losing your child for at least eight hours a day. You have no influence over that child in a godly way for that time. You are relinquishing your God-given rights and obligations to somebody else who might be qualified on paper, but they're not you. We've had at least three generations of use of daycare we're finding that these children have different types of mental disorders because of this. And in order to help cope, we tell these guilty mothers, oh, don't worry, it's okay. You have a job. You have a job outside the home. It's okay to dump your kids off. They're feeling guilt for leaving their children behind. Yet we're searing their conscience, further allowing them to be ungodly. Now these qualities we see further reinforced in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also might, may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating, plating the hair, and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Again, the wife is to be in subjection to her own husband, showing him respect or reverence, and by doing so, her godly example has the potential to convert the ungodly husband if he's not a Christian. 
it would also spur the husband, if he is a Christian, to remain faithful to God. Now, the focus of this passage is that of the inward qualities, not of the outward adornment, makeup, jewelry, the clothes. Now, this is not saying that women have the right to dress in immodest apparel. Obviously, we know better. We should. But the focus is not what you're wearing as far as jewelry, how you do your hair, what kind of makeup you wear. The focus is the inward spirit, your attitude, how you conduct yourself. Now, since the wife's role is to keep the home, she is the foremost teacher of these children, or child as it may be. We've heard many times that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. It is the mother who has the best capacity for producing future elders, future song leaders, future deacons, future preachers. Likewise, having daughters, teaching them how to be wives of the same. The world obviously needs more godly mothers, especially as we as members of the church. If we're not able to perpetuate God's gospel, who is going to do it? You think any random person out in the world is going to do it? No, they're trying to trample the gospel of Christ underfoot. We need godly mothers, godly women stepping up, fulfilling their role, slowly changing the world one child at a time, beginning in their own home. If we don't have that, guess what? Look around. That's where we're at. Now verse 4 of chapter 6 of Ephesians tells us the role of the father. This is quite a small verse, but it speaks volumes. We're going to try to cover some of those volumes. It says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Our text charges fathers with two great commands. First, to not provoke their children to wrath. But instead, to bring them up in nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, this idea of provoking your children to wrath, it is not making them mad or upset or even angry. Because sometimes corrective discipline brings about anger. Sometimes you've got to pull the leather belt out. When the child's done wrong, you use it on them. Now, while I'm not advocating for beating your children all the time, sometimes it's appropriate. Look at all these children in the world that need a good whipping. They wouldn't be acting like fools on the midnight or the 6 o'clock news. Probably the midnight news either. No, this provoking to wrath deals more with making this child bitter. It covers cruelty, acts of severe embarrassment, humiliation done by the father to the child. It's to the point of disheartening that child, continuously beating down that child until that child thinks he or she is nothing worthless, useless. That's a difficult thing to overcome. But it can be overcome. It needs to be overcome. I'm speaking specifically of the child receiving that type of treatment. Summed up, provoking one under wrath in this context deals with discipline without love, also known as child abuse. Because such treatment of children brings about deep-seated anger within that child. Where do you think that child is going to show that anger? It won't be with the oppressor. It will be out in society. It will be possibly to the siblings. You can see that behavior carried out. Now instead, God expects fathers to discipline with love type of discipline that must be meted out must be tempered with love. There must be training performed 
This is instructive discipline. Teach them what they're supposed to do. Set forth the expectations. And when they're met, fathers, we need to praise our children when they do good. Now, when they don't, the proper, the appropriate form of corrective discipline must be ministered. We know from Proverbs that foolishness or silliness is bound up in the heart of the child. We also know that the rod of correction removes it from that child. We have to teach it out of them and sometimes use that rod of correction. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 15, chapter 23, verses 13 and 14, and chapter 29, verse 15. We see the two extremes in child rearing in our day today. Discipline without love, which is child abuse. Love without discipline, which is permissiveness. We either, the streams basically being, we either mistreat our children or we give them everything under the sun and then wonder why they're brats. God charges the father put to both use love and discipline in rearing those children. This provides the capacity for a properly functioning child. It also shows how God deals with his children. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 5 through 11. We know from verse 4 a simple truth. Great men excel in three areas. Great men excel in providing, protecting, and preparing their children. A godly husband, a godly father, will provide in many different ways. All too often we focus primarily on the finances. Well, how good of a provider is he? Oh, he's got a great job. Is that it? All too often, unfortunately, it is. A godly husband, a godly father will be working a job, will be financially providing for the family. However, they provide emotionally. They teach these children how to regulate their emotions. We are all born with emotions but we're expected to regulate them. The father is expected to teach his children to do so. He provides the mental growth, that is maturity, teaching the knowledge and wisdom. He is to provide for them physically, sustenance needed for growth, food on the table, proper shoes, proper garments, even a proper roof over their head. And he's to provide socially for them. He is to teach them how to fit into society. Now the, the godly husband, the godly father, will protect his home in different ways. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. A godly husband, a godly father must be physically and mentally capable of defending his wife and children. He provides quality for the betterment of the home. He is a spiritual leader. He is thus expected to protect that home from any type of error, false doctrines. Nowadays you think of burglary, home invasions, the husband is expected to protect his family from such things. He has to be mentally and physically capable of defending his home. You don't know why that individual is in your house. You just know they're there. They could be doing harm. They could intend on doing harm. As a godly husband, do you think you're just going to throw up your hands and say, have at it? And then watch the carnage occur? You think that's a godly man? let alone a godly husband? Absolutely not. You think of all the pedophiles out there. They're labeled as transgender. They're really just transvestites. But they're nothing more than predators stalking their prey. Lions hunting gazelle. Fathers, what are you going to do when your little girl goes to the restroom 
and a transvestite walks in there after her. That's a very real scenario that we will probably face. Because it's becoming more and more socially acceptable. Why? Because we don't have godly homes standing up against it. Now it was asked one time, probably several times, but a pedophile was asked what he typically looks for in a potential victim. Says he looks for children either without a father or if they do have a father, one that is not directly involved with those children. Where are we fathers? Are we involved with our children? Are we even present to begin with? That's a weakness that's being exploited by those who know better. Now the father is expected to prepare these children for the real world. They are expected to teach good work habits, good work ethic, respect, manners. The list goes on and on. Practical matters such as maybe changing a tire changing the oil in the engine, airing up those tires, things that you don't really think about until you're on the side of the road and you have no idea what to do. So what? You call somebody else. Not saying there's anything wrong with that, but the father should be able to teach self-reliance with his children. Now, a, a sad fact, the parents are expected to teach their children to no longer need them. It was asked one time, what's the best part of being a parent? The answer was watching your children grow. What's the worst thing about being a parent? Watching your children grow. Because one day they will not need you if you've done your job. They will be able to go and start their own home and perpetuate what they have learned and maybe even build upon it, thus adding to the number of godly homes in existence. It will not happen by magic. It has to happen by teaching, by godly examples being set by parents. Now, godly men are to provide the environment in which all of these things are expected to occur. When you expect a garden to grow, you don't just throw seeds on the pavement. Maybe some people do, but you have no right to expect plants to grow. You pick out a plot of, of soil. You prepare that soil. You set the bounds. Maybe if you have deer, you put up an electric fence. Depending on what you're growing, you might lay some stakes so they can grow up that wood to provide structure support for that vine. There's a continuous supply of nutrients that must occur, water, sunlight. A great man provides these sort of things for his home. He provides the environment for these children to grow up to be godly people. Now studies have shown that when a wife and mother has the full support, and I'm not saying one aspect, but mentally, emotionally, physically, the support needed from her husband, the children benefit. Husbands, you support your wife, that type of support gets extended to your children. Now, that's not saying you should never support your children. I think we've seen so far that you should be doing that. But the more support you give to your wife the better your children will be. Now, how do you allow for a wife and mother, a woman to be as feminine as possible? How do you allow a woman to be the best that she can be? You have a strong man present in order for those things to occur. A godly man will allow for that sort of thing to occur. When there is security in the home, Women and children will thrive in that home and become what God expects them to be. Now, 
I'd like to talk about a few secular things as far as benefits are concerned of a godly home at this time. Basically, seeing God's wisdom for the home unfolding outside of Scripture. Children in two-parent homes are less likely to experience academic, social, emotional, and cognitive problems. Not only as children, but this would seen, be seen later on as adults. Children reared in a godly home are 20 to 35 percent more physically, excuse me, more physically healthy than children from broken homes. Children of divorce are more likely to experience headaches, speech defects, and other health concerns. Children with actively participating fathers tend to be happier, smarter, and more successful in school and work. When the father is emotionally supportive of the mother, she is more likely to have a greater sense of well-being. Such mothers are more likely to have healthy pregnancy behaviors, which indicates a supportive father increases the likelihood of the mother and baby being physically healthier. Good fathers decrease the likelihood of adolescent drug use. The children are less likely to act out, be disruptive, be violent, lie, and steal. Fathers help keep children out of prison. Roughly 70% of juveniles grew up with a mother only or no parent at all. 70% of our children who are incarcerated grew up in a broken home. Godly fathers help prevent that. Children with a godly father are less likely to be bullied and less likely to become bullies themselves. Boys with good fathers have their masculinity affirmed and learn how to properly regulate their strength as well as other emotions and abilities. Girls with good fathers are more likely to have healthy relationships with boys and men in adulthood because they learn from the father how proper men are to act toward women. Thus, she is able to differentiate from inappropriate behavior and avoid being exploited by predatory males. We need more godly men. Basically, those traits which are labeled as toxic masculinity are what makes little boys and little girls become what God expects them to be. It should not be any wonder that the things that certain people call toxic masculinity are exactly what's holding the family together. Now, there is no such thing as toxic masculinity. There is no such thing as toxic femininity. Now, there are indeed toxic men and women. But God designed gender it is not fluid. That's fluid. Gender has been set. Gender is not toxic. God made it. However, the actions that some perform are wrong. Now this morning we've considered both the structure and the home that God expects to be in existence. We have studied how each member is expected to conduct themselves. And by doing so, following this pattern, the home shows forth God's wisdom, God's manifold wisdom. Godly homes present godly principles, both inwardly and outwardly. These children, by example and teaching, learn to be godly, and by those examples in teaching are able to teach it to the world. The world can see a difference in us. This is seen by submitting to God, submitting to proper authority, exercising authority with a sacrificial love, 
developing others by proper instruction and example, rendering sincere service, and exhibiting justice and fairness. The home, as we stated, is the building block of society. We can plainly see God's wisdom displayed in the home, how it's structured, how the roles are to be filled from each member, and the ways each member are expected to conduct themselves. The home has always been a great blessing for mankind. Unfortunately, it is increasingly so. What do I mean by that? The more and more we see less godly homes, the more precious they become, the more rare they become. What kind of a home do you have? Is it godly? What kind of, what time of, or type of mother or father are you being? Is it godly? What type of example are we showing forth? I'm not excluding myself from this. Everything I've said, I expect to be able to do myself. God expects that from me. I've got to lead my home. I've got to instruct my children. I've got to teach them to be not like me, but to be better than me. Be like Christ. Where does that, have, that teaching expected to occur if you're not the home? The home is where instruction and discipline must begin. If you rely on assemblies such as this, Bible class, or any other gathering of the saints, your home is failing. Assemblies such as the worship assembly should be supplements. They should be reinforcing the principles already taught in your home. Not laying the groundwork. Teaching such as, what must I do to be saved? Well, what, what must I do to be saved? You know, we, we have a song, and I don't think we sing it very often, but it, it uses a child's hand and it shows them the plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. A child can repeat that. Yet we have too many adults that, for some reason, when they leave this building, forget that principle. Not only do they not act as Christians when they leave, when they go out in the world, but even worse, they're not teaching their children how to act, how to be, ch be children of God. Now this morning, if you need to obey the gospel, whether by becoming a Christian or by having your sins removed as a child of God, take the time, the next few moments, to do so. As an alien sinner, those who have not become children or Christians, you will be added to the family of God. And it's no mere mortal that does the adding. It is the Lord himself. When you've rendered obedience to his gospel, he adds you to his church. And you're expected to live like a child of God. Now, as a child of God, if you've not lived like one, take this time to remove those sins through confession and prayers. We stand and sing.